A proud native of Brooklyn, New York, John mm -hmm. found a love for basketball at an early age. He accepted a basketball scholarship to Georgia Tech to play for legendary head coach Bobby Crimmins. From there, Sally went on to become a 15-year NBA veteran and was the first NBA player to win four championships with three different teams. After his retirement from the NBA in 2000, Sally explored several opportunities in both television and film. John's film credits include Bad Boys 1 and 2, Eddie, and Gary Bruckheimer's Confession, Confession of a Shopaholic. Shopaholic. John, John spent, spent seven, seven years, years serving as the co-host of the Emmy-nominated, critically acclaimed, The Best Damn Sports Show, period, on Fox Sports Net. He was also the host of the sports talk show, Ballers, on BET. John is the head of his own production company, John Sally Presents, Incorporated, where he uses his uncanny ability to find unique and interesting people and projects for film, television, and internet. John is actively involved with Operation Smile, PETA, and the fight against diabetes. In addition, John is involved with PCRM and visited Washington speaking to Congress about the Child Nutrition Act, asking members to support legislation that would increase vegetarian options in meals served in public schools. John has adopted a plant-based raw vegan lifestyle and is a frequent speaker at VegFest across the USA. As a wellness advocate, one of John's main missions in life is to continue to educate people on the benefits of living a healthier lifestyle through better eating habits. Most can achieve a goal and be pleasantly satisfied with the results, but to continually create new tasks to accomplish and to reinvent yourself is the mark of a versatile and motivated individual. It is the definition of a father, athlete, actor, entrepreneur, talk show host, philanthropist, wellness advocate, vegan, and champion. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight I introduce to you our moderator, John Sally. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. That was a great intro, Crystal, just like I wrote it. Thank you very much. Uh, that was really long, and uh, I'm glad we got that point out, but I'm very excited to be amongst you women. I'd rather be in... Um, the company of women. Obviously, you guys are smarter than men, um, and this is going to prove it. It's definitely going to prove it. Uh, I only have daughters. I have four daughters, so I obviously know I only make smart people. So <laughs> let's start off with six of the smartest people I know. Dr. Rose Blackburn, president of Morehouse School of Medicine, National Alumni Association. Hello, Dr. Blackburn. Uh, Miko Branch, co-founder and CEO of Mrs. Jesse's product for curly hair. Hello, Miko. I need a whole bunch of product. I need, I have a lot of natural <laughs> hair in the family. Um, hey, John. Carrie Connor, vice president of Nike Jordan brand, which uh, I used to wear. And I think you should send me some 15s. Uh, Hi, John. Talk to me. <laughs> yeah, I got you. Um, Irish Grant. Senior Director of Philanthropy and Development at Morehouse School of Medicine. Can't wait for you to have me there so I can speak to people about plant-based diet. Absolutely. Uh, Roberta Shields, CEO of Ludacris Foundation. Um, and he's not throwing any elbows. He's doing some, uh, the foundation's doing some unbelievable things. It always has. And Melinda Wright, Senior Program Officer of the Walton Family Foundation, not to be confused with the Walmart Foundation. They just own that business. The Family Foundation is entirely different. I, when I was with Walmart, we had a thing called First Tee, and they would play golf, and we would raise money. Um, I didn't play golf, so I just stayed and got massaged. But I, I worked with that foundation. So ladies, uh, women, uh, Thank you for being on the show. All right. Um, so let's get started because people are sitting around wondering what we're talking about. We're talking about philanthropy. And for those who understand, it's not just uh, I gave at the office or I gave whatever. This is something that's constant. This is something that it should be a part of your business. This is literally 20 to 30 percent of your business. It's 35 percent of your taxable income. So make sure you pay attention when they talk philanthropy, not only can you give from your heart? You can also give from your taxes. I just thought I'd drop that in there for those who don't know. All right, so we're gonna start with our first question. 
And this question is going to go out to um, um, Ms. Black, Ms. Blackburn, uh, Ms. Connor, Ms. Branch, and Ms. Shields. So one of you four, I would like you to answer this question. Maybe we start off with Ms. Shields first, OK? Um, the conversation this evening is focused on women in philanthropy. Can you define philanthropy? Ms. Shields. You got to take your phone. You got to take it off of mute. That little red thing. There we go. Okay, there you go. Uh, um, a philanthropy to me is the passion to help others. And I think with our community, I think that it's not new to us. It's true to who we are. As young people, we put a dollar in the mission. And as my son says, as his popularity grew, he wanted to do more for others. So I think it's reaching back and giving back from wherever you are, for whatever means that you have. I think the most beautiful thing a lady said to us, she was a recipient of one of our little Christmases and she said, Miss Roberta, may God continue to bless you so you can continue to bless us. And to me, that's what philanthropy is, is the passion to help others. Thank you. Dr. Blackburn. Same yeah, I, I think that, um, and that's, I think that's a great question. Um, as a physician, the only, I grew up wanting to help people. So having that as kind of my mission um, is to help people. So professionally, that was, you know, I had that giving service mindset. Um, I grew up mm -hmm. in a household where my parents were, are professionals but they were in government and nonprofit. Uh, we were involved in civil rights and other giving in church. So giving every Sunday in church was just part of what we do. Um, and then now as an adult, I'm a tither. So getting your uh, money and your values aligned, I, I see as philanthropy, um, mission driven. Um, I align with a lot of organizations that I'm passionate about like Morehouse, and others, my church and other organizations that are giving and of service. So really aligning your passions with your work and with your money, um, you make a difference. Okay. Mrs. Connor, you got it. Yeah. Yep. Space bar. I learned that today, right? Ah, you got that. <laughs> yes. You know, um, when I think about uh, defining philanthropy, honestly, um, I would echo what, um, what the uh, lady said, but also when I think about it, there's three words and it's really about how do you show love back and really just showing love back and making sure that we're improving human welfare and we're improving other people's circumstances. And so, you know, when you think about it, it's not just money, but that is a big part of it. It's giving of your time, it's giving of your resources. And when you think about it um, and really stop and think about it, there's so much that we can do in our daily life events that really does uh, embody philanthropy. So I try to do that in everything I do at work um, and excited to have this conversation with everybody today. Okay. Mrs. Branch, last one. I think you got to take your, you got to take your mute off. There we go. Sorry, John. Uh, oh, philanthropy no. for me is, it's giving and it's giving with your heart. It's giving with your mind and it's giving with your resources without wanting anything back in return. And I think from the early, you know, from the start, uh, I come from a long lineage of women who helped each other, you know, who really supported one another and what they were doing. And from those women came the children. And one of the kids that were produced from that group of women was my dad. And my dad, Jimmy Branch, he put my sister and I in a position to be able to be independent women, to be able to provide for ourselves where we could not only help ourselves, but help other people should we be blessed with the fruits of our labor. Um, luckily, my sister and I were able to partner together, create a wonderful hair care business, but giving was always on our minds. So when we discovered that our hair, the hair that God gave us was the most beautiful thing, the most versatile thing, giving for us in philanthropy came in the form of sharing information, um, sh sharing the knowledge that our hair could do anything. So we did the unthinkable. And uh, we took our hats off as salon owners and stylists and really shared information 
to women about what their hair can do, how to care for it. And little did we know that we would really change the idea, the beauty standard and the beauty ideas that we had about ourselves, particularly in this country. So philanthropy came from a place, a good place of giving, a, a good place of sharing. And with that giving, we helped empower these women to help themselves with their hair, but they also helped us to create and build our business. So by the time we found some uh, you know, financial success, we were able to do things like uh, give to Morehouse and uh, support um, the United Negro Fund and, and things like that. Um, the New York Urban League, uh, we were in a position to give. And I think giving is so very much a part of what we do. It still continues to be. So, you know, you'll see Miss Jesse's, you know, any and everywhere we can be, where we're continuing to help people, whether it's through product or whether it's through, you know, any of the resources that we have that we're able to share. Thank you, Mrs. Branch. Uh, Dr. Blackburn, what in your life inspired you to get involved with philanthropy or involved with social um, initiatives? Um, as I mentioned, I, I come from a civil rights family. Uh, mm -hmm. So I grew up in NAACP. Um, I always wanted to be a physician. Uh, so I tried to align that. I still work on the NAACP National Health Committee. Um, and I became a um, physician after going to Morehouse School of Medicine. So their mission is aligned with improving health access and health equity. So I just spent my life trying to align all of my values and have a, a career that was uh, of service. Um, that's part of it. And then um, just my passion for Morehouse and giving the Morehouse came out of, I, I remember being a student with no money. Um, some, sometimes we live, instead of living from paycheck to paycheck, we live loan check to loan check. So I know what that's like for students. You're, you're about to eventually make a good salary, but the years, the, the years getting to that are, are lean and, mm -hmm. you know, you're in your twenties. So you feel like you're too old to keep asking, you know, your parents for money. So, you know, we, we, we depended a lot on, on each other. So, um, and so I want to get back. I want students not to have to have that burden like I did. Um, as I said, I give a lot at church. Um, so just wanting to help others, this passion for um, wanting to give. And um, I, I know who mentioned uh, about giving of your time. When I didn't have money, I had time and I had um, ideas. So I volunteered a lot. Um, growing up in different organizations. So now um, I have the opportunity to give back. So I, I really believe in the scripture of uh, to what, to, to whom much is given, much is expected. So I kind of align uh, my work and, and my, my spare time around activities and around people that are, are in the giving spirit. That's wonderful, yes. <clears throat> Thank you for that wonderful answer. Um, okay, so, um, Mrs. Wright and Mrs. Grant, I'm gonna ask you two a question right now. Um, uh, it's been said that women and men think differently. Um, and I have to agree, I live in a house of seven women and there's a lot of thoughts going on in there. And the only other male is my, is my puppy and he listens to them. So if we do think differently, I'm pretty sure we give differently. Um, tell us a difference. Let's start with you, uh, Ms. Grant. Um, we absolutely do. I, I mean, I, I will state that statistically women give 80 to 90% more than men, not only um, in across generation lines, but across uh, the distribution of wealth and income. Women give more. And I, and I believe that because we have such a passion as nurturers, um, we are multitask runners um, with family and and life and jobs and caregivers and, and independent. And it shows across the generational gaps that we give and we give very differently. Um, we give from our passion, but we have a tendency to give more and more often. Um, and that's not to, to downcast what the, the gentlemen do in any way, but um, I do believe that it is, our, it is our ability to nurture and to, uh, in our personal lives and our, even in, in our professional lives, the manner by which we give is just multiplied because of what we do. So 
um, I, I know that it's 70% of global giving is given by individuals, but the majority of that, a little more over than 50% are women and females that give in, uh, in, in charity and philanthropic perspective. So we are, we are not only caretakers of our homes and our families, but we're take caretakers of the world. And for those who, uh, who don't have a voice or have opportunity, we, we are the key to that. Okay. Mrs. Wright? Yeah, thanks for that, Iris. I and John, I echo everything you said. And one thing that stuck out in my mind is that while women don't get paid as much, we do tend to give more. So highlighting that. And also I noted in doing some reading on this um, that we tend to give to organizations that benefit women and girls specifically. And I think that's inherently because we have an understanding of the lived experience of being a woman. I also wanted to share um, two data points that I think might tie into why we give more to women and girls that I came across this week that were pretty powerful for me. The first was that of the nearly 70 billion yearly foundation giving, only 0.5% of that is specifically dedicated to supporting women and girls of color. And that basically equates to about $5.48 per year for each woman or girl of color in the US. And then the other number um, that really struck me was that more than 45,000 organizations dedicated to women and girls receive a total of 6.3 billion in charitable contributions from foundations, corporations, and individuals. This is in 2016, so it's a little dated, but these organizations comprise actually a relatively small portion of charitable organizations. So I share that to say again, that I think our giving um, to ourselves is really um, benefiting us. Where, where are you reading that from? So we can, so we can reference it. Yeah, I read there's an organization called Women Moving Millions that I just came across and they recently created a report um, that shares a lot of data about women giving and as well as um, how philanthropy impacts giving to women and girls and women and girls of color. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to stay with you, Mr. Wright, uh, each, like, and I'm going to go. So this question is going to go to Mrs. Shields, Mrs. Connor, Mrs. Wright, but we'll start with you since you were on. Uh, each of you represent a different organization and a different perspective. How did uh, you being a woman of color uh, affect the final decision? Yeah, <sighs> um, I love this question. I've been thinking about this. So um, as I mentioned, I work with the Walton Family Foundation and I would say Walton has been rooted in equity um, as a foundation from its start. What I will say though, in light of COVID and in light of the Floyd protest and, and much of the social unrest, we had to take a hard look within and look at our strategy and ask ourselves the question of whether or not our strategy is truly rooted in equity in a way that would push for meaningful change. As we asked that question, I, as a leader on the team, um, started thinking about this question of proximity, meaning are we actually working to situate resources and capacity with people who are best positioned um, to solve the problem. Um, said differently, when we think about communities that we work with, I think for a long time, many foundations would sort of go in with a top-down approach. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, here's our solution, here's dollars to execute our solution. And instead we've tried to revamp and say, you know what, let's think about this differently. Actually, you have the lived experience, you actually know the best solutions. So let's actually situate resources with you so that you are leading and designing your own solutions. So um, I won't labor more. The last thing I'll add is to that end, we started thinking about if we could work on a project with Black foundations to expand our network, Black founded and led um, to start a project or initiative where we could raise capital for Black entrepreneurs. So. Right. Cool, that's dope. So I'm going to make sure I get in touch with you after I have I have this, uh, this black foundation. It's called Give Me All the Black Money. Oh, and I'll I spread love it. it. <laughs> Give me all the money and I'll spread it to who, who needs to get it. Uh, Ms. <laughs> Mrs. Connor, what do you think? I'm going to re ask the question. You uh, represent different organizations and your perspective. What has been the difference? Um, you being a leader, woman of color, uh, with the outcome. Yeah, I mean, as a, a woman and a, and a woman of color and being uh, in, in the corporate, uh, corporate world, for me, it's been more about, you know, how do I use uh, my power and my influence? And so 
uh, it makes me think about when I took my first uh, sales director role with Jordan Brand, it was in New York City. And um, I was getting inundated with calls every single day from retail partners. And all they wanted was, I need more retro. I need more Air Jordans to sell in my stores. You have to give it to me. You have to give it to me. And I took that moment as a time to say, you know what? It's time to flip the conversation. And I turned the conversation back on those retail partners and said, hey, you know what? Instead of talking about, you know, how do you get more retros and how do you get more Air Jordans to sell? Let's talk about how can we serve the communities where you sit and where you lie. I want to partner with you on that. I want to partner with you on how do you partner with organizations in your community? How do you fund initiatives? How do you give back and show love back? And so that is something that I used my power and influence as a Black woman, understanding and seeing what was happening in these underserved communities where all my retail partners were sitting. And I knew from a business perspective, my strategies were set, we were good, but we had more work to do on the front of just making sure that our communities were in a better place. And overall, I will say, I was happy to see that the calls kind of dwindled away and it was more about calls on how do we partner because they saw that we all win when our communities win. And so, you know, you think about it uh, from the way I lead, you know, some could say, you know, the feminine traits of leadership are more collaborative than they are competitive. But I think in the nature of being collaborative and being in that way to want to achieve a common goal, um, we were able to you know, make change. We were able to create and make impact. And that's really what it's all about. So um, you know, power and influence is important, but you have to use it for the right reasons. Dope, dope. OK, Mrs. Uh, Shields, the same question. OK, can she hear me? You got to, yeah, you got to get that mute button. Yeah, someone keeps yeah. muting me. So um, <laughs> what I want to say is um, what's instilled in you as a woman and when you lead as a result of um, your voice maybe not being heard at the table. Um, and so for me, it was making sure that I thought very strategically, I was valued mm -hmm. my voice. And as you said, um, building things collaboratively but relationship building, women are, are very good at that. Um, my father always told me, you can do whatever you want to do. And so I've taken that. And then, you know, my foundation, my son's foundation, it is his vision, I implement against it. And with that, it's always about building the business case as I approach an organization, because I think that, um, there's, there's value in giving in your community, just as you had communicated, and that value we want to see. So we want to do business with those individuals that are doing business with us, letting our communities know that those businesses care about what's going on in our, in our, um, on in our communities. And for me, it is making sure that I am building relationships with those organizations that are in need, um, whether it's APS, whether it's the rec center, whether it's the Boys and Girls Club, and also having good relations with Walton Foundation, um, um, Jordan Foundation, um, um, the Nike brand, and um, bringing those two pieces together to show how we can uh, do more and let our community know we care about them. Okay, cool. Um, this question is going to go to uh, Dr. Blackburn and uh, Mrs. Grant. Um, with all the unknown variables going on in politics and social, um, the social climate, uh, what are some of the challenges that prohibit women from giving? Well, I, I think women, we've established that women are the bigger givers. So mm -hmm. I think what may prohibit women from giving more is we still don't make equal salaries to men on the dollar. So I think advocating for equal pay and pay that's commensurate with our talent and skill set will advance women and, and advance their giving. So women are, we've established women are already out giving everybody. Um, but I think having pay equity, um, career advancement opportunities will push women to give more and to be more influential. But we, we've established that we're, we're, we are givers, even with making less 
and doing more, we give more. So um, I think we, as women, we should advocate for pay, salary, career advancement um, consistently and relentlessly so that, you know, our giving can um, advance with us. Yeah, you know, it's, it's a trip you say that because women only make 42% of what a man makes in the same position. And it's 2020. And it's been like that. It's been like that since the beginning of time. Well, since they started letting women work um, in the open market. So that, that is a trip that it's even at that point. And like uh, Miss Miko Brandt said, I'm start my own business and pay myself my, I, I do that with my daughters. I, man, I mandatorily make them become entrepreneurs. Um, that way I don't have to hear your bad day at work. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, so this question is going to go to uh, Mrs. Shields, Mrs. Oh, wait, did, did I let Ms. Connor, Ms. Grant? Ms. Grant, do you want to answer that question for me? I, was, yeah. hmm. um, I, I agree and concur with, um, with Dr. Blackburn. I think that um, some of the challenges that would normally stop um, the male gender from giving, if it is income, I think women pivot great in times of challenge, right? We're used to being able to pivot. We're, we have the strength. And so um, I think that women will universally find other ways to give, right? I think that if, if finance is a barrier, that women will come through with being able to volunteer. Um, they'll come through with giving time and talent as much as they do treasure because we are so agile. So I think that the challenges that we need um, as women, um, regardless of our social economic variables, I think women are going to come through for the need, right, in their mm. community. And so maybe they financially may not be able to give or write that check that they normally do, but they're going to be sensitive to the children in the neighborhood. They're going to be sensitive to the young professionals or their coworkers, right? And so they're going to find other ways to meet those challenges. Um, which are just as important. But I do believe that the financial crisis that we may be upon if we, if we have to shut down again, right? If, we, if the political climate is what it is, um, I think the women are gonna lead the way in how we, we write that narrative and how we engage um, because we've got single families, single parent families, um, incomes that are going away. We have, you know, rise in numbers right now with COVID-19. And the reality is that the ta that taxation in, and burden is on the nonprofit organizations. And it is incumbent upon us to figure that out. And so I think that women are going to be the leaders uh, in that when, when the monetary perspectives are the same. Yeah, I do believe the, the future is female. And uh, we, we got to remember that. Um, so this question is to uh, Mrs. Shields, Mrs. Connor, Mrs. Branch. We're going to start with you, Mrs. Branch. You mind if I call you Miko? Oh, sure. <laughs> okay, Mrs. Branch. Um, <laughs> uh, as a woman of color, what is your personal approach to impact investing, and how does it differ from your male counterpart or your colleagues? Uh, I'm not really sure what the, the men or the males are doing. I know for me, um, you know, mostly all that I do has everything to do with what's meaningful, um, you know, in terms of giving, whether it's philanthropy or whether it's investing, I try to align myself with things that share similar values to what I, I believe in, how I'm feeling about things. Um, it doesn't always turn out that way, um, but for the most part, I really try to uh, do the right thing and do good things with my giving, with my investing. Um, my mother and I sat down the other day as I become more sophisticated with investing and just how things work and how to do things as smartly as I can. And sitting down and sharing that information with my mother, it was really nice to know that she too and I think I probably get it from her. She wanted to um, take her money, the little bit that she has, and she wanted to invest, um, particularly during now when we're seeing a lot of violence. She wanted to make sure, you know, I don't want to do anything that has any guns in it. Um, so that's like one form of just really being mindful about how you give, how you invest, and how you support uh, different things. So um, that spirit or that intention that she has, it also, uh, it shows up through me. It also shows up through my son. So just really doing things that are meaningful and that are, are good. Great. Mrs. Connor? Yeah, you know, for me, um, I decided a, a long time ago in my career that 
I was going to bring my whole self to work um, and I wasn't going to make any edits. Um, and maybe that could be the same or different from my male colleagues, but for me, uh, what you see is what you get. Um, I don't edit myself. Uh, and, you know, and what people see, yes, they see a black female, but they get that I am a, you know, a baby sister. I'm a, a daughter. I'm a, uh, a, you know, a mother of two. I'm a wife. I might be a binge watcher of Netflix, but I bring my whole self to work, uh, you know, every day. And I want to see more women do that. I want them to feel comfortable in their skin, not feeling like they have to make any discount or changes to how they approach the, their, themselves in the workplace or anywhere. Um, it's just important that we, we always show up as our full selves. That's so. Uh, Mrs. Shields. Um, I'm gonna twist it. I know Miko talked a little bit about the um, consciously giving to um, causes that have social impact. Um, a good example of how we do that with the foundation, we realized that there were over 400,000 um, residents in Atlanta that were underrepresented for the census. And they came to me and they said, Ms. Roberta, can you help invest in this? And I looked at the numbers and I said, if we spend this amount of dollars and we can get 10% of those 400,000 to fill out the census, that in itself would put $9.2 million into the community. People can go out and they can beg for money, but if we can just have conversations with individuals and let them know how important it is. And so we invested in some of the collateral, the door knockers that went on the door, some of the billboards that went on, and we made a difference. Uh, we got about 12% um, change. And so I think those are the conversations that we want to have because that has a direct impact. And if we can have those conversations with those individuals at the barbershop, that are saying, oh, I don't want to do that. You know, they're going to find out where you live. I'm like, uh, they know where you live. You give away more than that on Facebook, okay? So <laughs> <laughs> having those conversations and helping individuals invest in themselves to invest in their community, that to me is impact. And I also got to tell people, uh, some people think they more important than they supposed to be. Like the feds ain't spending time. <laughs> To come get just <laughs> hey, they, they 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 don't even chase the cops. You think they're gonna chase you? Okay, so uh, we're gonna, Mrs. Grant, I'm gonna ask you this question. Um, what are some of the challenges women of color face in in the industry of philanthropy? Um, I would say that it's, it's, it's been my experience in, in my career, and I would say it's one thing that I think Morehouse School of Medicine does very, very well, is that we are um, in a time where we have to move away from some of the traditional formats of how we do fundraising and how we do philanthropy, right? This, this is a time where we have to be strategic, we have to be able to pivot, we have to be um, in a position that we can really think about sustainability in our nonprofit base and in our sector, right? Because most nonprofits, they struggle with where the operational administrative funds come from. And I think that women leaders are very sensitive to that. And so being able to um, speak in formats that are not necessarily traditional and being able to have that voice and that voice be heard and accepted as the professional in that area and in that expertise, um, I think that is, that is a challenge. Um, because people tend to stick to what they feel they know. And I think a lot of times your counterparts um, will feel that in their position that they may necessarily know best from a traditional standpoint. And I think women, again, are able to bring some of the, the uh, different thoughts, right? And creative thoughts, especially as women of color, because our experience is different both um, in and out of the, the boardroom. And, and so I think that we are able to really kind of meet the perspectives of change. Um, and so being able to really be able to voice that and have it with clarity accepted right out of the gate, I think that's a, I think that's a challenge right now in yeah. the industry yeah. for us. Uh, Mrs. Wright, same question. Uh, being a woman of color, what are the challenges you face in the industry? Yeah, I think sometimes I would say our experience is um, undervalued. And I would also say 
oftentimes we talk about the, you know, getting the proverbial seat at the table. Um, and I think many of us have gotten to the table. The question is, how do we use that seat? And can we use that seat? And sometimes I find as a woman of color, leading in certain spaces, one of my biggest challenges um, is thinking about how, at least from the seat that I sit in, how do you get capital and resources to leaders of color who are historically undercapitalized, not receiving resources at the same level as many of their white counterparts. And so one of the things, one of the challenges is being a really strong internal partner um, and sort of telling the story of leaders of color in the field and the sector doing all this great work and being a really strong external partner to leaders of color and helping them um, access social capital in different pathways. Um, so I would say that's probably one of, one of the greatest challenges. I got another question to all the women on the panel. I just want to put that out. Do you think we should stop saying um, people of color and just say black? The, uh, what what do y'all think about that? I, I, I don't think, I, I think we should always be respectful in how we refer to ourselves. So for some people, it's people of color. Some people like black. Some people like African-American. So I, I think they're all, I personally think they're all fine. I think it's contextual sometimes. Um, so as long as we respect our, ourselves and what we're saying, I think there's some terms we, we should never use about ourselves. Um, and, and I think we know what those are. Um, so I think as long as it's respectful and in the right, correct well, context. Well, what, what do you mean? Um, Angry? We shouldn't use those things? Because they, every time they talk about <laughs> Black women, I'm doing this great movie here. It's called Sneakerella in Toronto. So I'll be calling you uh, Jordan Brand. But okay. I'm doing this movie. And one of the things when we were auditioning, when they were auditioning for my wife, is they were talking about being a matriarch, but being, you know, I, I think they were looking very stereotypical. Um, I hope they weren't looking for angry. They weren't looking for upset. They weren't looking for a chip on the shoulder. I just thought that because as I read these questions, I see we dance around a lot. And what I've determined in my life is I'm not dancing around anymore. I'm black and I'm, I'm African. I'm a descendant. So I just thought, you know, I'm not putting anybody in the blast. I just thought I would let you guys know when I read questions, I see women of color. It it kind of makes them feel better. And I'm I'm tired of making them feel better. Like, and when I'm yeah. talking about them, I'm talking about everybody that is afraid or has held us back, no matter the color. So I'm just thought I'd mention that since I had so many strong black women on on the panel that I would get that point up. Okay, on and, to the and next. To that point, if I could push that point, um, John. Yes, Miss Blackburn. When we walk into the room, people see a black woman. So no matter what we, we're calling ourselves, that's how you show up. No matter what, you know, you you whatever your inner dialogue is. So it's unmistakable. Um, so to your point, we we got to embrace it, and and I I think all those terms do embrace it. I think women of color may be inclusive in some settings. Good, good, okay. Um, this is the next to last question that I'm gonna be taking uh, questions from the audience. I mean, from the uh, viewers. Hopefully you guys have questions that we didn't ask already and make sure they're not long-winded because I will cut you off. Okay, <laughs> the question, uh, um, each of you are mentors in your own right. Um, how do you inspire young women, young black women, uh, the importance of giving? And let's start with um, Ms. Shields. <laughs> um, how do I inspire young women with respect to giving? It is letting them know that they can give whatever it is that they have. That I think someone said, and I like that word, it's not treasure, that mm -hmm. so we can only give. Um, we do something called um, my empowerment with young mm -hmm. girls. And we talk to them about their brand and we talk to them about building their one minute um, elevator speed. But they talk about these are my strengths. These are my values. And mm. we will say to them, you know, sometimes if you have a hard time finding out what your strengths are, ask your girlfriend. Because sometimes things come so easy to you that you don't really think of it as a strength. It's just who I am. 
and to watch them interact and give to each other. And they come back with the aha that I have value and I'm sharing that with someone else. And if it's a little young person, I talk to them about, you know, sometimes we use big words, like we say philanthropy, but I say to them, well, do you give a dollar to the missions? Well, then you're a giver, you invest. And when you can do more, you will do more because your heart is already there. So pointing out to them the ways in which they are giving so that they can consciously do more of it is one of the ways that um, I think I help inspire young girls to um, value themselves and see the value that they give to others. Okay, Ms. Blackburn? Yeah, um, your, your talent and, and your, your time is, is critical. Um, I mentor um, students interested in um, going to medical school. I help folks with their applications, with their interviews. So that's just time. Um, it doesn't financially cost me anything, but it, it's a commitment I, I may, I've made and you know, people call me all the time and, and I, I, I love doing it. Um, so it comes, also comes from the heart and um, to what Roberta said, it, you know, your friends point out what your strengths are sometimes and they say, Rose, you know, you're really good at that. So, so then they send people to me so, and, that, and that's fine because I love it. Um, so I think, um, you know, giving your time and then your treasure, your, your resources. Um, a lot of times people think of philanthropy as you have to be giving millions of dollars, which is always accepted, but it, it doesn't, you know, a little bit goes a long way in philanthropy. So I, I started a family um, a, a scholarship at Morehouse in my family name. Um, and it, it's, it's not a lot, but the school is messy and I hope to grow it. So again, a little bit can go a long way. Cause as I said, I remember being a student and you know, medical school, medical training, um, um, a physician is these school, these are long roads um, in, in training without uh, a lot of resources. So I always align what I do and, and help people in, in different ways. So it may be an application, it may be a pep talk, it may be, okay, this is what you need to say on your interview. And then there's a financial piece. So the giving, the actual dollar giving, and that can grow as your career grows and progress, progresses. Okay. Uh, Mrs. Connor? Um, you know, for me, it, it starts with my own children. Um, my daughter, Layla, she's seven. And, you know, um, every two weeks she gets an allowance. It's not a lot, uh, you know, a few dollars here. Um, but we give her four jars. So she has a jar for spending. She has a jar for uh, savings, a jar for investing, and a jar for giving. And she has to divvy up a percentage of her allowance into those jars. But she gets the most excited about what she gets to give. Because she gets to be creative and think about how she, you know, how she's going to spend that money um, to give to someone else. And so, you know, you got to build the muscle early in order to, you know, create that next generation of, of philanthropic leaders. Another way is obviously through mentorship and through sponsorship. That's very, very important to me. So, you know, I'm very proud for the mentees that I do have. You know, the biggest thing I say is, is I'm giving back to you and giving my time to you always think of how you can use your time and give back to those that are younger than you and looking up to you as well. You know, cause you're never too young to mentor another uh, young woman or, you know, just young uh, person in general, you know, and then sponsorship, that's also another way of giving back because I'm really focused now on how do I pull other black women up through my organization. I really want to make sure that they, uh, you know, get the same experiences um, that I've had and, and beyond that and the opportunities. And then you got to lead by example. So I sit on the board of uh, the National Board of Friends of the Children, um, which is obviously, you know, making sure that we're focusing on underserved youth. But then also within Jordan Brand, we have our National Wings, Wings program, which is aiming to, you know, create a better future for underserved youth as well. So just making sure you lead by example and you continue to, you know, impress upon those who are watching you and, and looking up to you to inspire them to do more and give back. Uh, so, okay, uh, <clears throat> this is the last question and I'm gonna start off with Mitch Branch. Um, is there a woman of color, uh, I'm sorry, is there a black woman, uh, <laughs> a woman of color philanthropist that inspires you 
And if so, why? Um, I absolutely, hands down, I got to give it to Madam C.J. Walker. Um, there's so many similarities when I told our, our dad, Jimmy Branch, that we really wanted to be serious, get more serious about this hair thing. He put a book in our hand and he put us on to Miss, you know, Miss Madam C.J. Walker, her story, how she bootstrapped, how she did it herself. And not only was she a creator and became successful at it, she also spent equally, if not more time in giving back to all the people who helped her get to where she was. Um, so her spirit, her, her example is just, you know, really, really prevalent in my life. So um, I would have to give it up to Miss Madam C.J. Walker. And to all those people out there, it's not the movie. Read the book. The, the movie, all right, I'm not going to say anything because I, I love seeing Black people on screen, but read the book. That's all I'm saying. Uh, the same question to you, Mrs. Wright. Um, I'm definitely going to read the book. And I do want to say to your earlier question, unequivocally, it's Black people. Um, yes. I, you know, sometimes I think women of color is appropriate, but I do think we should use black. Um, the woman, there are lots of women I admire, including my uh, dear friend, Roberta Shields on the line. Um, and in addition to uh, Roberta, who's, who I've had a chance to see in action, um, there's another sister, Liz Thompson. I think I mentioned her earlier in the call. She and her husband, Don, um, run their own family foundation and they model interge intergenerational giving. They bring their family, their kids along in everything they're doing. And I think that that's a good and healthy model when we think about philanthropy. The other thing I would say about Liz, she is unapologetic about giving to black people um, in a way that I have learned that it's okay just to say this is for us by us. Um, and so, the last thing I'll share um, is just that I've been working with her on a project called the 1954 Project, which we're super excited about. Please reach out to learn more. We're trying to significantly um, raise gifts for Black entrepreneurs in education so that instead of getting smaller amounts of money over a shorter period of time, they're getting much more significant gifts over a longer period of time uh, to help them dream at scale. Okay. Well, Mrs. Seals. I love you. And make sure you tell my boy I said uh, that I was so gracious and wonderful to you today. But uh, um, I've, been, I've been with him a long time. Um, you just was, was uh, put into somebody that you inspire other people. So who inspires you? Wow. Um, you can say John I Sally, they know. <laughs> well, you know, I always sound so business minded when I say when we first founded the foundation, I looked to business models to say, who is doing this very well? And I looked to Magic Johnson's organization and they were doing it extremely well. I looked to Alonzo Mourning's organization and they were doing it very well. And I feel like I'm having a senior moment because it was the women that were behind those organizations that inspired me. They put the infrastructure in solid. Um, they shared um, with me because when you start a, a celebrity foundation, the IRS is looking very closely at it. Um, so I've had people who have helped me. Um, Tracy Morning, she, she's an amazing person. Um, she gave me an aha. She had young girls come in and she had maybe 12 um, ladies stand up. And one of them said that she had her child when she was 13 and 14 and she was a lawyer. Um, and the stories went on like that. But when she introduced us, she said, this is a role of phenomenal women. And you know, I looked to my left and I looked to my right. And then I looked out at the audience. And so often we say to young ladies, um, be an adult, act like a lady. And Tracy looked at them and she said, this is what ladies look like. So um, Tracy, wanted, yeah. Okay. I'm going to tell Tracy you said that. Oh, you know, that's my girl. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, ladies, I would like to uh, thank you. Uh, we are now going to move over to some questions that uh, Rochelle, who is no longer nervous, ladies. She, she's been sitting back there <laughs> drinking martinis. Um, 
she's gonna there's some questions hopefully from the audience so go ahead Rochelle yes okay great job um not only have I received several questions but I've received a lot of comments um, from several audience members who is talking about how inspirational this panel has been. Your words have been powerful and inspiring um, to a lot of um, people who are watching. So, um, and I, I echo the same sentiments. I've learned a lot about each of you individually as a collective. The first question that came in, um, has COVID social unrest in the current political climate changed your philanthropy, your philanthropy efforts? And if so, how? And it was um, open to anyone who was willing to answer. Um, Iris, do you want to take that one first? Um, absolutely. That's a great question. I will state at uh, for Morehouse School of Medicine, we've had to make a lot of critical adjustments. Not that we move from the mission of health disparities, but of course, COVID-19 has exposed what we've always known is that um, African-Americans, populations of um, rural populations and people of color um, have been severely impacted by health disparities and the social economic variances that then compile that. So with COVID-19, we not only had to look at the services that we were already providing, um, but we had to look at how we could engage. Tele, for example, in a, in a clinical telehealth uh, went from in a matter of two months increased by 700%, right, of, of people that needed help and assistance and couldn't get to a physician. Um, and so we had to, as a team and as an institution, really look at where we were and how we were engaging and how we were engaging our partners, strategically coming to the table and saying, this is, this is how we were having conversation. Now this is the way we need to move with um, our students and with the communities that we're serving and with the physicians, the providers, our frontline workers, which were extraordinary um, students that wanted to come on campus, students that wanted to give and, and participate. Um, all of those things were kind of made like a perfect storm in healthcare for us. And we had to respond, not just immediately, but also had to think about what's the level of engagement that will happen this winter um, and post COVID-19. So there were specifically for um, the Office of Institutional Advancement, it, there were a lot of changes and conversations that we had to adjust to. We had to then even elevate our voice for social impact and, 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 and civic justice conversations. Um, and I was very, very proud of the team and the institution within itself being able to take a bended knee, right? On so many levels of how we engaged and what we needed to do. Um, and be at the forefront of that conversation to be unapologetic as a Black institution, as an institution that provides, you know, Morehouse School of Medicine provides 20% of the physicians globally. Wow. Really? Right. So we're on that forefront. And I think Dr. Rice and, and the team have done an amazing job of not only carrying the daily mission, but elevating it and then taking on the impact of how COVID-19 is affecting the health, just even in Atlanta and nationally, um, a 700% rise, which has doubled for our clinics um, of people calling and needing help and needing assistance. That elevates what we need to ask for, that elevates how we need to engage with partners, you know, corporate and strategically. Um, our pipeline programs with children, like all of those things have been impacted. And so I'm very, very proud of how the institution has uh, quickly been able to respond and think ahead about what being able to predict what's going to happen and being prepared for that. I can't wait to come into Morehouse School of Medicine and talk about <laughs> nutrition and how nutrition has been a strong fight against any kind of disease, especially COVID, because most of the people who were dying, uh, supposedly, who were dying had pre existing. Um, condition, meaning what we call um, American diseases as diabetes, high blood pressure, um, or you mean all the stuff that Black people get from eating dead food and slave food. So when I come down to Morehouse, when I'm in Atlanta and we have this conversation, hopefully the physicians and the teachers will also pay attention 
to um, the information. Now, in case I got to do this now, you can go on and check out me and two of my uh, doctor friends, Dr. Columbus Batiste and Dr. Eric Walsh. We have a program called Slave Food. You can see it right there on YouTube. Punch in slave food, stop eating slave food. Okay, We're next take question. We're definitely gonna take you up on that, John. We're definitely gonna take you up on that. And I will come down and speak for free, just like I'm doing now. <laughs> no, no, no. We're not gonna say you speak it for free. <laughs> okay, I'll, be, I, I, I'll do it for I'll do I'll do it for a minimal fee of twenty five thousand dollars. No, don't worry about the money. <laughs> that's next enough. Question, that's enough to start an endowment, an endowed scholarship. It, it will. I'll come Thank in there wearing my Jordan brand Nikes. <laughs> and, and and wearing a ludicrous sweatshirt. Yes. Um, and I but, buy it all from Walmart. Speaking <laughs> of the <laughs> speaking of the Jordan brand, um, here this question is actually for you. Um, it was based off of your comment about not editing yourself. And the question is: um, speaking of how black women are viewed, how would you suggest mitigating a situation in which I and my counterpart can say the same thing? but receive one reaction in corporate while my counterpart is emphasized it. I missed that last part of that question. Basically, how is it that, how would you mitigate a situation in which I and my counterpart can say the same thing as a black woman, um, but receive one reaction while our counterparts um, receive another one where they're more emphasized? You know, I mean, no matter what, you're going to, however you show up and how you, however you decide to uh, conduct yourself in the workplace, you know, everyone is going to receive you. Um, you know, they may receive you differently. They may receive another person differently. What I will say is um, don't be so concerned with how um, individuals may be received versus yourself versus staying the course and staying consistent and being confident in who you are. Um, you know, as long as we're respectful, as long as we, um, re you know, respect the lines of, of, of our workplace, we treat people with respect, we treat people kind, we treat people with care. Um, just stay confident and consistent in how you show up and how, who you are. And I really don't think you need to, I always say this to people, I don't go home thinking about other people. I don't go home thinking about, you know, what did they think or feel about how I, how I said that in that meeting? Because at the end of the day, I feel good about how I showed up. I feel good about how I conducted myself. And that's the most important thing that you should ever worry about. Um, what, what others do and say and how they're received is, is their situation and their scenario. But what you do is what's most important and feel good about that. Okay, next question. Yes, this question was actually uh, for Mrs. Shields and Mrs. Branch. Um, what efforts do you think we should do to get more women of color or black women who give philanthropically to also give politically to give us more power? I know for myself, uh, recently I joined the Shirley Chisholm Cultural Institute where um, I'm typically um, known for giving in, in the beauty space, giving products, giving time, talking about entrepreneurship um, and also, you know, giving money. Um, but recently I joined this uh, organization, the Shirley Chisholm Cultural Institute to really um, speak to some important causes and matters that are happening. Um, uh, this, this organization is right here out of Brooklyn. That's where I am. That's where I built my business. I'm a native New Yorker. Um, so I think with education and just being open to broadening what giving looks like to you uh, can end you, you know, can, can uh, lead to maybe a little bit more political um, influence or making change there. I know it's happening for me, um, but because I'm so immersed in my business, I don't get a chance to get out that much and see what others are doing. But I know for me, it definitely feels like good work. Uh, there's a lot of vigor to it. We're just understanding what some of, some of the things that are happening um, in this world, particularly in our, our communities and the ways that I could help have a voice and maybe make change in it in the end um, has become really um, invigorating for me. Okay. Um, I don't know so much about um, having people give politically. I thought the end of that question was going to be, how do we get women of color to give more 
focused within our communities. And I know one of the things that um, the Walton Foundation is focusing on is just making more people of color, black people aware of the wonderful things that multiple organizations are doing across the country. Um, I came into an event in Chicago and I have grew up in Chicago, so I have a lot of friends. And once they, it was on education and we're focusing on helping our young people. And this virus has put our kids so far back. Um, we've done some Zoom calls and you've got kids who are babysitting their younger brothers and sisters. And so if you're watching those teachers, their kids are, you know, getting breakfast for their younger brothers and sisters while they're trying to be on the call. And one of the things that the Walton Foundation is doing is, is, is reaching out to people who give. And in Chicago, some of them said, well, you know, I give to the museum because we've always given to the museum. But now that I know about these wonderful organizations that are working with our kids in education, because our kids are our future, they're wanting to shift those dollars um, to those organizations to help our young people get a better education. And we're um, making people aware of best practices, where they're doing it right, where they are leveling the educational field. So I'm going to answer that question in terms of what are you doing to help um, organizations that are gonna lift up our children and that is making them aware of who's doing good in our neighborhood. Okay. Well, last question, Rochelle. Yes, um, this question is actually for Dr. Blackburn. Being that you are the only, only panelist that does not represent um, an institution, organization, or a foundation, what advice would you give to a young woman who is looking to grow in their ability to be a philanthropist, um, but don't have the capital and not sure where to start at investing? Um, I'll answer it in, in two ways um, and emphasize the first, one of the points I made earlier. Um, I think there's, you don't have to start with big dollar giving. Um, so you align, you have a budget, where, whatever job or even if you're in school, you have a budget, um, you know, figure out what, what, what you can give um, and then align yourself with you know, what your interests are, where, where you're passionate. Obviously, I'm passionate about Morehouse. Um, I'm passionate about my church. I'm in other women's organization. I'm passionate about political giving. So these are the things I know and like. Um, and then I do a lot of volunteer work. So you see other opportunities. So I would say start with what you like, what, what your interests are, where you volunteer, and um, in your community or, and now a lot of, you don't even have to do something um, outside of your home. There's a lot of opportunities virtually to become involved in organizations. You know, one of, one of the good things that have come out of um, COVID is that a lot of things are virtual, which gives you a bigger reach. So I would, you know, start small and then grow that. And it could be, you know, joining or aligning with an organization uh, that, that speaks to your passions and interests. Wow. Mr. Sally, well, there is a question for you. Oh, okay. The first question is, um, after listening to the women on the panel tonight, what stood out most to you as a man? That's the first question. And then the second question is somebody wanted you to uh, tell them more information or where they can find more information about your food, your healthy food. Okay. First, uh, I, I, second one first. Uh, I have a, you can go to johnsally.com. I have a vegetarian starter kit, which comes from PCRM, Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. That's our lobbyist group out of DC. And uh, you can also check us out on YouTube uh, with Dr. Batiste and Dr. Welsh. Uh, slave food, straight up slave food. And it's not making fun of us. It's one, talking about the way we eat food as Blacks. Uh, who were enslaved, who our ancestors were enslaved and what we were given. And two, now that we don't have to eat those things, how we are still 
a slave to food and slave to something else, not paying attention, not being in control. So that's the first thing. And if you ever come to California, I own Cafe Organics uh, with my two partners. Organics with an X on the end, and it's really good. We got some Cajun food, we got some burgers. I did everything that we would definitely have, along with black art on the wall and a nice a range of uh, um, coffee house hip hop. So I, ha I, I have a black Starbucks, just I have better coffee and better pastries. I'm telling you. <clears throat> Second, what did I think about being on the stage as women? If you know anything about me, I'd rather be around women Anyway, men usually want you to hunt and they play video games. I don't. I read books, um, smoke cannabis, uh, and, 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 and I know about wine. So I'd rather be around people who deal with that. Being around these wonderful women, um, me having daughters that I raise, I always push them to look at things that are very important. That's why I'm not, I'm not dissing the movie of Madam C.J. Walker. I'm telling you to read the book because one, it enhances your brain. Two, it's not bastardized or it's not whitewashed like the movie was. Uh, oh, I didn't mean to say that. Uh, there's so many things. My mother was born, she passed this year, but she was born in 1923. My mentor, she had me at 41 years old. So you understand I was around a very strong woman and I don't recommend it. Uh, I, I don't recommend not being around a woman. I don't recommend not seeing them as strong women have 400 trillion more emotions than men women are according to the way they think black women don't have pain uh in surgery so just knowing that that is a thought process on this original um uh, humanoid that started the human race i just think it's i just think it's great and somebody said i did not answer my question i did <laughs> uh, ladies, I would like to thank Dr. Rose Blackburn, um, Miko Branch, Carrie Connor, Iris Grant, uh, Roberta Shields, and Melinda Wright, and also thank Christy for doing a great introduction to me, and James Hammond for making sure this all went well, and Rochelle, guess what? It happened. It was great. This is so bomb. Everybody Thank join you. us on YouTube. Check us out for the next thing. Uh, go to johnsally.com. And as I always say in uh, departing, vibrations. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. Great job. Thank you. Hold on, Thank Pam, you. one second. Thank you.